Hello and welcome. My name is Mackenzie Kelly Frere and I'm a weaver, artist, and educator living in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot people of the Treaty 7 region, where the Elbow meets the Bow River. I'm just thrilled today to be in conversation with Jane Kidd, who happens to be uh, a mentor of mine and who taught me at the Alberta College of Art in the 1990s. Hello, Jane. Hi, Mackenzie. Great to be here. Um, as Mackenzie mentioned, um, I taught at Alberta College of Art and Design, now Alberta University of the Arts. And that was a very important part of my career and very, very formative in my progress as an artist. I'm living now on Salt Spring Island, which is the uh, traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And uh, I continue to weave tapestries. Mm -hmm. Great. So Jane, to begin, um, can you tell me a little bit about beginnings, how you began in weaving, and how did you know it was for you? Let's see now, so long ago. <laughs> um, yeah, art school was a difficult time for me. Um, I was always interested in the arts, but going to art school was not a good fit. Uh, I was kind of caught between the end of modernism, beginning of postmodern theory, and it, I was out of sync, it seemed, most of the time. So I looked for non-traditional ways to develop my interests. Travel was very, very important. And I also took courses um, from... Uh, a number of uh, in a number of places in Vancouver, in particular with Joanna Staniscus, a well-known mm -hmm. Vancouver tapestry weaver. And she introduced me to the mechanics of tapestry weaving. And she also introduced me to what was happening in contemporary textiles, mm -hmm. in Europe in particular, but also in the uh, US. And this changed everything. This was a fit for me. Uh, it, was, mm -hmm. it had the kind of materiality, color, the potential for idea, a very personal touch. Um, so I knew this is what I wanted to do. I had to just find my voice within this uh, wonderful technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'm going to share my screen now so we can look at an image of uh, one of uh, the two pieces that you have in the Prairie Interlace exhibition. This is um, Land Slice 1 and Land Slice 3. And um, these were woven in the sort of late 1980s, and I find them particularly fascinating is because they really engage with the structure of woven tapestry in a really sculptural way. Um, and at the, same at the same time, they also speak to the time they were woven, um, inspired by the work of Peter and Ritzy Jacobi, who I know um, are artists that you admire, along with Magdalena Abakanovich. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about these works? I think folks might actually be really interested as well to learn how they were woven because they are they are particularly anomalous um, with when you think about flat woven tapestry. Right. Um, yeah, these are early works on a series of works that I continued for a period of time. Um, they were woven on a floor loom, which was the only piece of technology weaving technology I had at the time. I didn't have the tapestry looms that I have now. Um, and I had uh, come to the conclusion that I was never going to be a functional weaver. That wasn't going to work for me. I didn't have the sensibility for that. So um, I had to find a way, I wanted to find a way of working with weaving that would be my voice where I could fit myself in. And as you mentioned, I was looking at works like the Jacobi's, Sheila Hicks, Abakanowitz, um, and I admired that work, but it had an aesthetic that I couldn't quite fit into. So this, I'd experimented with pulled warps a little bit in some other pieces. And this allowed me working on the floor loom, um, setting up uh, a different spacing in the warp, different kinds of warp material, using different wefts, allowed a kind of individuality. I, I felt I found my voice with these pieces. And although they look very different than the works that I'm currently doing, they were in a way quite pivotable, pivotal. And I think in, in some ways having this opportunity to be part of the exhibition has given me a chance to relook at these pieces mm. and realize that in doing them, I recognized my love of detail and the authority of detail, nuance, the desire to take the weaving process, but find ways of manipulating it within the box. 
um, not going off the loom, but working with the structure, but pushing it as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an approach that I've tried to continue in my other works, in my future works, um, in the flat woven tapestry, a sense of color, of shape, of form, of the textile as an actual object mm -hmm. um, and a richness of color and surface. Yeah. Um, all, of, all of those things. So these were important works, although I hadn't really thought about them a lot until this exhibition came up. Yeah, yeah. Color in particular, I think in these um, is something that carries through in, in even work that you're doing now. And I can see sort of a similar sensibility. Um, throughout your career, as you mentioned earlier, when we were talking, you were talking about um, teaching tapestry weaving and studio art at the Alberta College of Art and Design, now the Alberta University of the Arts. And as a teacher myself, I'm really invigorated by the practice of teaching and I know all the different things that it brings to my own practice. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how teaching has impacted your own uh, work and uh, maybe even perhaps contributed to the development of the ways you work in the studio. Right, definitely. Um my time at um, ACAD, at the art college, was pivotal. Um, uh, uh, art schools are often referred to as a kind of hothouse environment, and they are intense, um, exhausting in some ways, but they are all about learning, not just for the students, but also for the faculty and everyone involved. Um, I learned more about myself as an artist at, during my time at, um, during my time teaching. I learned what was important to me. I learned to be open-minded about what art was. I realized how important it was to understand the roots of the medium that you work in so you can position yourself and discuss your work uh, intelligently, to mm -hmm. feel rooted to a kind of tradition, but also open to moving forward. So um, teaching is also a, a team activity. I worked with fabulous colleagues, all of whom influenced me greatly in, in my progress. And we had amazing visiting artists at the college. Um, so yeah, along with travel, uh, I would say teaching, at, my years of teaching have been the biggest influence in forming who I am as an artist, how I see myself, how I position myself mm -hmm. in the world of arts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, just a very, very important time. And um, I hope that I connected with students and encouraged them to find their individual voice within the tradition of, of weaving. Yeah, yeah. They push you too, don't they? Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> they don't let be. you rest. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss that. You know, I'm away from that now, retired from teaching and I miss that constant challenge. I find it so easy to kind of slump into, oh, I don't know what's familiar. Whereas students and even your colleagues are constantly questioning what you're doing. And I, I think that's so important. I have to work much harder now at maintaining that kind of integrity in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to switch over here to another work. Um, which is much more recent, Land Sentence. It's interesting that you say, you know, that you, you've got to watch um, or you won't push yourself because I think in some of the, your newer work um, and right up until now, you are really pushing the envelope in terms of what tapestry can say and how it can engage with contemporary topics. Um, narrative, I think, is really key to all of your work in terms of the way that storytelling functions. I think storytelling is a function of tapestry. Um, as a medium and always always has been. Um, increasingly, like with this, with Land Sentence series, um, this narrative has become focused on the collective challenges we're facing um, with climate change. And um, I'm curious how this work came to be, because it was quite a big pivot in a way from a more uh, personal narrative focusing on, um, you know, travel and collections and, and being human. Um, to the, the ways in which people are impacting the world around them. So, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. This was, uh, this series was, was pivotal and, and uh, represents a change. Um, and again, personal experience um, was the impetus for the work. 
Uh, I traveled back and forth between Calgary and the West Coast pretty much every summer. And mm. each year I noticed changes to the environment that I was driving through. Uh, pine beetle infestations, fire, logging. The landscape was constantly being altered. Mm. And uh, year after year after year, I noticed this more and more. And it became kind of an obsession. Um, and I did further research, sort of looking um, with from aerial, uh, aerial photography and satellite imagery to see what these changes were all about. And it seemed to me that more and more the landscape was being almost subsumed into material culture. It was being completely mm -hmm. altered and controlled by us. Um, mm -hmm. And that became kind of a, a way to enter into this conversation about climate change, which you know is, is unavoidable. And although I wonder what I add to the conversation because it's so prevalent now, I feel very dedicated to exploring those ideas um, in my work currently yeah. uh, and finding a way to look at our relationship to the changing world and also our complicity in uh, the way the environment is, is changing. So yeah, Land Sentence um, series, three of them were, were very important uh, and led into future works, really my focus now in terms of my work. As you've done several of these and they're quite large, what do, Two, two odd meters in width or so? Yeah, just yeah. under two meters. Um, um, yeah, they are, they are um, fairly big. It's probably the largest I work um, yeah. normally just because of the time involved. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like the scale. I think you needed the sort of panorama scale yeah. because of the landscape references. I don't usually work with specific landscape Landscape has become more of a symbol to me, uh, although I'm, I do reference aspects of the landscape, but it is usually stylized and abstracted as, as it is in, in this series. Yeah. What do you think it does to the digital imagery um, to recontextualize it in this way, to render it in thread? I, I find that quite curious. Yeah, I think it's interesting to look at a, a digital source like uh, you know satellite photography and and the kind of technology. In a way, we record the world through technology now. Um, in a way that makes it again brings it back into material culture. And I'm mm -hmm. always interested in this relationship between the natural world and the human world and how so much of nature has is is in a way becoming controlled by by humans, it, it's becoming kind of a, another aspect of material culture. We, we are curating it mm -hmm. and also destroying it, I suppose, if we look at it that way. So, um, and, and also I think we're, it's interesting to bring the hand into a very digital world. It's easy to overlook the value of skillful handwork um, and rendering things in our first technology, which is, working with our hands. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that link. It's a subtext, I think, through all of my works, yeah. uh, even though the subject matter is maybe more explicit in terms of environmental concerns, handwork and the value of skillful work is a subtext. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of taking time, uh, approaching things slowly also becomes a kind of subtext. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've just switched the image here to Inheritance um, series, which is your new work that you, you've been working on quite recently. I just received the images of the next ones that I'm gonna show you, the, the coats. Um, and there's an intimacy to this recent series, a similar theme to Land Sentence, um, working with the same kinds of images, um, but it really renders this specter of ecological devastation quite personal um, in a really, impactful way, at least from my perspective. Um, I'm also curious about the ways in which it's shifted towards dimensionality. Here uh, in the remnant pieces, we have things that look almost like a portion of a garment. You can see a sleeve, um, this sort of thing, all the way to the gowns here. There's two of these gowns woven um, very recently, 2021, 2022. Um, and I'm just interested in this shift towards adding a little bit of dimensionality to this imagery of, of ecological devastation and the land. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I touched on a couple of things there. Um, mm -hmm. The shaping, the moving towards more dimension, um, I think comes from a number of sources, partly a fear that in the latter part of my career, I'm going to slip into habit 
but mm. wanting to maybe uh, invigorate what I'm doing. So I looked in a way, it's a sort of interesting full circle thing back to the very dimensional works of my earlier period, mm. looking at the idea of what, what else can I do with tapestry? I've always been interested in, in it as an object. So making it more dimensional, working with the drape of the actual fabric builds on that quality of an object. Mm -hmm. But as with all of my works, making that kind of dramatic shift in this case to a more dimensional form has to come in conjunction with the idea. It has to be in service of the idea in a way. Um, I've, I've displayed things before on shelves and on lecterns, on, in frames and so forth, all because it made sense to the idea. Mm -hmm. So yes, I wanted these works to be intimate in that they drew the body into the work. Mm. Uh, there is a reference, of course, to, to a garment. Uh, it makes us a bit more involved in the work, a kind of absence of, of the human body, but, in, but an implication of complicity mm -hmm. in the imagery. The imagery was all drawn from um, uh, works are, are in a way patterned with uh, imagery from abused uh, landscapes or um, abandoned industrial sites. Mm. Um, so I embracing that tradition of patterning, but yeah. looking at the kind of uh, sort of patterning of which often has drawn on the, the natural world. And I'm looking at the world around us now and patterning these garments with the reality of what our current situation is. But yes, I want them to be intimate. They're child size in a way. So there is maybe also here a reference to a kind of legacy that we might be leaving um, yeah. in terms of the way the earth, the world is changing, the way the natural world is changing. And again, yeah. the way it is, um, the way we are complicit in, in those changes. So yeah, I'm excited about these works. I've got a few more planned. <laughs> Um, and it is interesting to be moving on into the dimensional form. Um, and again, I think, yeah, I feel good about trying out these new things at this point in, in my career. Uh, I'm certainly still interested in flat tapestry, um, but you yeah, know, this is a this is an interesting change for me, and I'm I'm really happy to embrace it, and I'm quite pleased with these pieces. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, this all seems very quick. We are at our time today. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing um, this, uh, your thoughts on this work. And um, yeah, it's been a lovely, quick conversation. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> lovely to, to talk with you, Mackenzie, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. to share my work. And I'd like to extend my thanks to all of the people involved in this really wonderful exhibition and to have mm -hmm. the opportunity to talk like this. I truly mm -hmm. appreciate it here in my isolated situation on Salt Spring. Yes, very, very I hope nice. folks get a chance to see the works in person and um, all of the other uh, interviews and uh, panel discussions happening related to the symposium this fall. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.